to answer any questions. Thank you. Very good. Thank you. Hi, my name is Michael Cunningham. Thank you, Madam Chair, for having us, and, and Chairman, thank you for having us, and all the committee members. My name is Mike Cunningham. I am the Chancellor of the National University System and the President of National University. And uh, an interesting note, I was the uh, Dean of the College of Business for San Diego State University before I took this position. Um, what I'd like to do is tell you a little bit about National University and the students that we serve to set the context of our involvement in uh, how we want to help the healed students uh, go forward. Um, National University system is comprised of the flagship National University, also JFK University right here in the East Bay, West Mid College, and also a City University of Seattle. We are a nonprofit institution, and National, Univers National University is the second largest nonprofit university in California. We have over 24 campuses throughout California. Pretty much where the uh, CSUs are is that's where you'll find us. We have uh, campuses very close to all the healed campuses that are here. We serve the uh, non-traditional student. Our average age is 32 years old. We have a great retention rate. Our retention rate is 78% uh, for our students. Uh, we have 50% undergraduate, 50% graduate. We're half online and half in campus, on campus. We're the number one transfer pro nonprofit private university for the community and college systems of California. And we confer more teachers in California than any other, any other institution. 10% of teachers in California each year graduate with their master's program, undergraduate program, or their credential from uh, National University. We're 60% less tuition than the other nonprofit universities in California. Our tuition is roughly around $15,000 a year before discounts. Our loan default rates are less than half the national average, which is 7%. Uh, the national average is 14%. So we're really excited. We run a really strong operation. Uh, we were formed in 1971 to serve uh, the military coming back from the Vietnam War. So we're proud to be part of the system. We are, as you can see, in and of California. And we think it is our duty and our mission to actually create as many opportunities for as many students as we can. And that's through affordable, accessible, quality education. And then also to create as many opportunities for as many graduates as we can. And that's by lining up our, their skills and competencies of our graduates to fit the local needs of this, uh, the communities in which they serve. So we're really proud of what we do. We have around a $650 million quasi-endowment and we have no debt. So that just gives a framework that we're at. Interesting to note, that we were one of the parties that were interested in inquiring HEALD. We met with the management of HEALD and Corinthian. We met with the Attorney General's office. Uh, after a thorough investigation of our board members, we decided not to go through with that transition. And later on in questions and answers, if you would like, I would give you the reasons why we did not go forward with that. Um, we've been meeting uh, regularly with the students of HEALD and uh, in the 10 workshops that they've had on the different campuses. Uh, we already had, as the same as the community colleges, had articulation agreements with uh, the healed, uh, st healed universities for transfers. Uh, and we've enhanced that since this whole situation has come about. Uh, we, we think that the solution is a collaborative solution. The solution will need to be a public-private partnership of all the parties that are gathered at the table, plus other nonprofit uh, universities. We are WASC accredited and part of AI, uh, ICCU. Uh, and we think that it has to be based on three major things, and that's a high-tech solution, a high-touch solution, and a high-choice solution to make sure that the students are treated fairly, that it's a transparent solution. And we need to form a clearinghouse, I believe, of information so the students get real facts. And I know many of the uh, folks that were up here today are all doing their part in that, but we need to consolidate that both public and private, including cost of tuition, including uh, articulation agreements so that the students have all the information and their families have the information they need to actually make uh, really good choices. Um, I think not one institution in California can solve all the needs of the Corinthian students, the healed students in California. It's going to take this partnership. I'll give you a for instance. There was a, uh, a student, we'll call her Miss Garcia. She has 59 uh, quarter units towards her degree. And we need to develop pathways for student success. And to do that, the most, the, the most opportune area would be taking some community college courses up front, then perhaps testing out a few with CLEP so that we're t reducing the amount of courses that are needed. That student would need around 14 more courses to graduate. And then bringing that down to around eight or nine courses through testing out through community colleges and also uh, with uh, public and nonprofit universities. So I think that's a really good solution. Um, realistically, I think there's probably 30% of the students that 
it's, it's, they should probably take advantage of getting their money back from the, the uh, federal government because the, one of the problems is the cost of tuition that they were paying for the degrees that they were getting far outweigh the uh, return of educational invested dollars for the career that they would get. So, but that's some, some hard talk that would uh, need to be had. So I, I welcome any questions if you would like. Thank you. Good. Thank you. Question. Um, good morning. My name is Todd Erickson. I'm the uh, Vice Provost at William Jessup University. We are uh, a private faith-based university of 75 years old. We're based predominantly in Rockland, but we have a San Jose campus as well. We're WASC accredited and a member of uh, AICCU. We focused on really assisting the healed college students. Again, I think for reasons understood that that was the best fit for us. We had some working agreements. We had articulation agreements already. And we were really helping focus the, the students that had uh, the view or, or the goal of having a four-year degree option. That was the best way we could assist them. So we really kind of uh, addressed some of the things that we did around those options. Uh, we really had uh, some simple streams of activity. We, of course, attended, uh, along with uh, a few other very fine institutions, the uh, tr transfer days. We, uh, we had to uh, be present. There was so much confusion at that time that they needed a lot of people to show interest to them right away. We created a, a web landing page specifically targeted for healed students, again, which, which put out there the, the thought that if they were interested in a four-year degree effort, that, that we'd be happy to talk with them. We also listed all of the other schools that had been at the transfer days. We thought the most important message the students needed to hear is they had options rather than trying to have more people sell them things, which, you know, they've been on the wrong end of that, unfortunately, for too long. So we were just trying to, and, and admittedly, when we talked with a student, we talked to several hundred at length, where we really couldn't help them. We were obviously very partial to the community colleges in terms of referring them back or to the few other uh, WASC accredited four-year partners that were in the mix. Uh, again, not trying to replicate more problems among problems. Uh, we created a broad range of, in the following week of the transfers, we uh, offered up our campus. We put group sessions together where they could just come in in a very low pressure environment, talk with our financial aid people, our registrar in terms of just transfer credit issues, talk with our learning commons which had career counseling and placement people there. Not so much, we didn't care if they came and, and, and enrolled with us, they needed information badly. And again, right fresh out the gate in that second week. So we offered that up, a lot of people came and took advantage. I think, just to confirm but a few points, you, we were asked about what challenges we found, and again, I think it corroborates some of the reports that you've heard this morning, but again, this is based upon first-hand student contact, if that, so if that helps corroborate things, that's what I can do. The first, there was obviously you know, the shock and confusion of having the students find out cold what was going on. I know there's some work behind the scenes, of perhaps through the Bureau and other things, about creating a support network ahead of time should this happen again. That would be an, an essential activity. Again, we are all scrambling to help and support these students who were very, very surprised. No matter what they might have heard, they were, they were very surprised. So anything we could do to create a support network to ease perhaps another transition that might come down the pike in a future closure. Second, um, those, uh, the student loan thing, which you've obviously heard. Unfortunately, the, the, the negative side of the federal regulations, which basically say you, to, to get forgiveness in many cases, you almost have to walk out of the education system for two years. And the unfortunate benefit is, I think you spoke about it, Senator, where now they won't be able to advance their personal career opportunities and their earning capacity for that much longer to be able to, to be whole financially. So I know there's work underway with that and encouragement about getting that tidied up would be good. And a very small last thing, um, it, it, it's, it has to do with the transcripts. Again, they received one official transcript. Um, hopefully these boxes and crates of records will show up in the bureau at some point. They can't get jobs, they can't advance themselves at all without actually having more than one official. It, yeah, a tiny thing, a really big deal to a job applicant right now. So I think we're we're perhaps ready for whatever question. Okay. Right. Uh, thank you. And um, I, I did have one question, if I could, to Mr. Feast. Uh, you mentioned and talked about the transferability of some of these credits. What is the process that you're going to use? Certainly, we don't. You know, you can't just blanket give them credit for the courses that they've taken. But is is it a faculty decision? Is it a um, the chancellor, board of governors, who actually makes that decision? And uh, on a, I 
guess on a one-on-one -on -one basis is what I heard. Could you elaborate on that a little bit? See well, how we can give the best opportunities yes. for the transferability of these credits? Uh, and I'm not an expert in this area, but um, there is no statewide answer. It's done on a college-to-college -college basis. So each college determines what courses, what units or credits will articulate based on their curriculum and whether it aligns to the curriculum that was given at the institution. So it's very, very much an individual college-by-college college, um, process. And, um, and each college determines its own Correct. process criteria. Interesting. Okay. Thank you. That's a problem. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, um, what are the potential, I guess, benefits or unintended consequences of offering bog waivers, um, you know, priority registration, other accommodations for the um, Corinthian students as opposed to the regular person that comes knocking on your door? Well, we, we think that certainly the, the vast majority, well, a majority of these students will be eligible for the Board of Governors fee waiver on the natural. So um, we, we, and we want to make that, those students aware of that um, opportunity. Okay, so, so um, um, you have enough resources to, to offer these waivers? I mean, how, or how many students do you think anticipate coming to your door? That's very difficult to answer. I, I think uh, based on what we've seen in the last couple of weeks, th these students are very much interested um, in the near term of dealing with their issues about the loan discharge um, and their debt. Um, and they may not have made decisions about where and when to continue their education. So we have not seen a huge influx of these students at our campuses, um, but we expect that is likely to um, change somewhat in the, in the coming months as uh, summer enrollment and fall enrollment ramp up. Okay. Same thing with um, National and William Jessup. Have you seen enrollment, your enrollment boost yes. bump up a little bit? We've had 500 applicants from the healed students of wow. which we are processing the, um, the applications right now. And they're mostly business students that are applying to us, business students, some of the, uh, the healthcare students. And the good news is on the majority, there's, there's at least 10 programs that HEAL was offering that will accept 100% of their credits. They were WASC accredited, we're WASC accredited. Um, the bad news is the way that the HEAL was, was offering their credits and their courses, they almost flipped the, the normal educational process, meaning that you would take the vocational classes first and then do your GE classes for your degree after the fact. It was almost like an upsell, if you will. So it's hard, and, and usually if you go to traditional college or transfer college, you need the GE classes first before you go to the upper level. So there will be instances in certain programs that healed students will need to take more classes to qualify for a, a degree requirement. But um, I, I think if it's handled, I know it has to be handled on an individual student-by-student -student basis, but there's another thing out there. I think if we approach this as a collective, and these students were going to school face-to-face -face in cohorts, so they each had different programs. So if we look at it programmatically and by cohorts, I think we can more effectively address the situation than by going student by student. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Senator Bates? Who's first? You, you are. <laughs> Dr. Cunningham, a question regarding uh, your uh, decision uh, to buy and then not to, to purchase uh, these colleges. Could you elaborate on that? Sure, sure. Um, we, put a, we had a thorough investigation whether we should do it. And we were all about the student. I think all of us are here today about the student and student success. And that's the mission of our university. So we looked very carefully at, at the situation. Uh, and there were some talk about, well, it was the Attorney General's office. They were putting all these uh, caveats on any acquirer, uh, making, um, making it a, a very hard choice to do the acquisition. I must tell you, we did meet with the Attorney General's office. They were very fair. They were open. Any acquirer, they said, we're going to keep a real close eye on you to make sure that you do not repeat the mistakes of the past. And I think that was fair. What we thought it was an unsustainable business model, however. We saw that there was a lot of debt that was incurred that needed to be paid back, that $100 million with the bank. And also, there was a lot of contingent liability with regard to the real estate. They stripped all the assets out, and it was all long-term leases. So, and in order to make that, those payments going forward to be sustainable, there was a very high level of tuition that needed to be charged, the $39,000 for an associate degree that you heard of before. 
very unsustainable. So it's ethically, morally, we felt that we could not get into that situation to actually go forward with that. That was the main reason we decided not to do the transaction. Thank you. Well, you, uh, we've talked about business model earlier in, in uh, the hearing, and you seem to have one that's really uh, puts you at, uh, at the front of uh, the education nonprofit. So it's good to hear that you made those kind of decisions. Was your board involved in yes. all of those? Because that's the other thing that's troubling, that we had a board of directors for these other schools that seemed to be you know, absent uh, when needed the most. So sure. uh, yes, yes, we have a strategic planning and mm -hmm. strategic opportunities committee on our board that get very involved with any of these type of decisions. I, I think also, I think one of the problems was the, the, there were symptoms many years ago on this problem that was happening. And I think there was a denial that was going on within Corinthian, and also a denial uh, with other stakeholders that this was as serious a problem as there is. And I will tell you, I think that um, this is a part of a much larger problem that we'll have in higher education in general. And I think this is a wake-up call to us to say we have to confront these issues now. Especially in California, we have over 4,000 uh, jobs with college-educated folks by 2025 that are going to need to be filled, and the publics alone can't do it. So it's public-private partnerships in a meaningful way coming together to solve the employment needs of the state. Absolutely. An early warning system on something like we're experiencing on, on this front is really important. Agreed. Thank you. Thank you, Senator. Okay. Any other comments, questions? Thank you very much. Thank you. Appreciate it. Now it's time for public comment. Um, if there's anyone who would like to address the committee, please come forward and identify yourself and you have a minute. No public comment. Oh, here we go. Good morning. Uh, Madam Chair, members, uh, my name is Ed Howard. I'm senior counsel for the Children's Advocacy Institute, the Center for Public Interest Law, and the uh, Veterans Legal Clinic at the University of San Diego School of Law. I first want to thank the chair, uh, to the Madam Chair, and Chairs. Mr. Chair. <laughs> yes, uh, <laughs> so much for holding this hearing. Um, in particular, for, for you, Madam Chair, you've devoted your life. Uh, to education, and so this must be particularly distressing, um, given what you've done and devoted your life to. Um, I wanted to take just a brief moment uh, to contextualize today's hearing. Um, the troubles in the for-profit business sector are so widespread and so deep that 37 state attorneys general have come together to form a joint task force specifically aimed at examining and investigating the behavior of for-profit education businesses. And let us be clear, the uh, businesses that are currently the subject of either multiple state attorney general or federal investigation, these are not minor businesses. These are the flagship institutions of this industry. According to SEC reports EDMC is currently being investigated by 12 states' attorneys general for its business practices related to recruitment, graduation placement disclosures, and graduation licensing. ITT Education Services is today being sued by the SEC for fraud and has disclosed that it is currently being investigated by the attorneys general of Arkansas, Arizona, Connecticut, Idaho, Iowa, Kentucky, Missouri, Nebraska, North Carolina, Oregon, Pennsylvania, Washington, and New Mexico. DeVry is being investigated by Illinois, Massachusetts, and New York attorneys general. He, um, career education company, 12 attorneys general, and has recently paid a $10 million fine to the New York attorney general. Bridgepoint, Phoenix, and Kaplan. All of these for-profit education businesses, the flagship institutions in this segment, are all under investigation by law enforcement authorities all over the country. Now, the reason I mention that is because when you juxtapose those facts against what you heard from the LAO, that many of those institutions I just named, under current state law, are exempt 
from bureau oversight or any regulatory oversight. Why did that happen? Well, I was here at the time, and the reason in part it happened is because those, rep those institutions, those for-profit <coughs> businesses that were accredited, came to this legislature and said, for-profit, non-profit, public, if we're accredited, it shouldn't matter. We should all be treated the same. And we shouldn't come under the <coughs> regulatory oversight of the Bureau if we're offering a degree and we're accredited. Now, on paper, that's true. But we don't regulate on the basis of theoretical consistency. We regulate only when there's a reason to regulate and only when there's a demonstrable reason to regulate. And I will submit, respectfully, that on the basis of what happened with Corinthian, and on the basis of the data that I just provided you, that the time needs to come to an end in this capital where the narrative is, there's no difference between a for-profit and non-profit and public model. And the reason is, is because it's not true. And it's provably not true. It is impossible to imagine a comparable number of attorneys general investigating any of our flagship nonprofit universities like Harvard or Yale or Princeton or Stanford or the University of California or the Cal State system or the community college system. It's impossible to imagine this is measured against the number of attorneys general involved and the number of investigations simply one of the most troubled business sectors in the United States and requires the most exacting regulation and scrutiny not on the basis of ideological predisposition against for-profit or non-profit, but on the basis of the record and the facts. It is true that not all of the for-profits behave in such a fashion as to spark the interest of so many attorneys general, but it is too many of them. And henceforward, as you think about, and I was elated to hear so many of you talk about what can we do what can we do in addition to Senator Block trying to get current law enforced? What can we do? The first thing that we can do is start thinking about the regulation of this industry as benchmarked against its record when it comes to the interest of law enforcement, federal and state. And one thing, and I'll conclude with this, that we may want to consider as we weigh the fact that with Corinthian, Corinthian ironically, being able to get bankruptcy protection but it's students not being able to, one of the things we ought to consider is what many states require is that before you can do business in the state of California from this sector, you have to post a bond. You have to post a bond so that if Corinthian ever happens again, we don't have this really pretty grotesque asymmetry with the corporation being able to get bankruptcy protection, but the people that it failed not being able to. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you to the committees for holding this great hearing. Um, you know, I, I, I'm Debbie Cochran with the Institute for College Access and Success, or known as TECAS. You know, our organization is actually mostly focused on federal policy and making college affordable and making sure that all students from all backgrounds have affordable, quality college education options. And we've been highly involved in, in issues related to Corinthians closure in the last few weeks. And, and um, we've actually been working with the federal government to push the U.S. Department of Education on a number of things that folks have talked about here today. Um, for instance, we, we, you know, we've been pushing for executives of companies that are regularly committing fraud to be held to account. And we've um, urged the Department of Education to heighten scrutiny when colleges undergo a chain of change in ownership. Um, we've also, um, we're currently urging the Department of Education to clean up their list of what they call viable transfer options for students so that schools that are being sued for fraud aren't on that list. Um, and, you know, so we are, at TECAS, we are absolutely willing and able and uh, would be happy to help the legislature figure out what might make sense for California policy as well. You know, Mr. Wajkowski asked earlier why kind of more students weren't getting loan discharges or, or what was going on with the loan discharges. And I just wanted to share that on the, one of the days when HEALD was doing their transfer fairs, I was able to stop by a couple campuses. I just wanted to hear what students were hearing and see what they were seeing. 
And you know what I what I heard, um, you know, from the Department of Education was frankly not very much. Um, and of course, we've we shared these concerns with uh, directly with the U.S. Department of Education. But you know, primarily their guidance regarding loan discharge was: here's a piece of paper. There might be some loan discharge options for you, and here's your servicers that you can call. You can call your loan servicers, and they can give you information. Well, the loan servicers are directing students to call the National Consumer Law Center, NCLC. <laughs> Now, NCLC is a great resource. They actually run a website called Student Loan Borrower Assistance. They know everything there is to know. But there is one person at NCLC who answers student calls like this, and she does it on a part-time basis. This is not her primary responsibility. So it just really shows um, there is not enough support uh, out there for students. Um, the students, of course, I, mean, I would have no idea how to counsel a student on whether, you know, how a loan discharge versus STRIF versus what's, you know, what proportion of your credit should really have to transfer before you think, you know, loan discharge versus transfer is a better option. These are complicated things. These are costly decisions for students. And, um, uh, and it, I think just the collapse of Corinthian, you know, it's unprecedented in its scale in that there are so many students who are at this closed institution. I think because of the scale of the closure, it has exposed a lot of gaps in kind of related but distinct issues of policy oversight and student protection. Um, but school closures aren't a particularly rare occurrence. They happen. Um, but sometimes they just happen and we don't see what's happening to the students because they're small. So I think now that we see it at scale, we can see clearly where the gaps are. Um, and I think it's incumbent upon us to try to fix them. And I just really appreciate the, the legislature's um, you know, attempts to fix both the kind of immediate needs for students as well as look at the broader policy issues and how to move forward. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Any other public comment? Any closing comments from members? We learn a lot today? Yeah, pretty discouraging. Yeah, we learned a lot. Right. Now we know That's we have a lot of work to do. That's right. Well, thank you very much for your participation, and um, we'll get some reports back from um, some of the agencies that we've required, and I guess we will report back to some action, too. Senator Galgiani, you look like you want um, to say something. We've talked about the students throughout this hearing, but also I wanted to mention about the employees. Right. Um, because when I had the workshop last week, there were employees who had been paid the week before, and their paychecks bounced. Oh. So... Thank you. Okay. Meeting adjourned. Thank you.